nice. Uh, I know Fer Farida is a, is a good friend of mine. Hello, Farida. I know she was going to watch us tonight. Um, hello, I am Lenita Semanyahu. Um, we are uh, here uh, with Your Voice show uh, live on Facebook. And my amazing guest for today is uh, uh, Viola Davy. Viola is a psychoanalyst, feminist, activist, and traveler. Uh, she has worked in many countries, immersed in many cultures, and has seen how survivors have, so have been socially silenced by shame placed on them. She fights to end the social stigma. She fights to have survivors be heard. She fights to bring justice to those who have stolen the safety and innocence of survivors. She is the founder of Rape, a History of Shame Project. Uh, she is the author of the book uh, Rape, a History of Shame, Diary of the Survivors, a, a proud graduate of the Women Therapy Center Institute, a clinician, and a social worker. Currently, she is a, social, a clinical director at the residential uh, HANSC program, a rape counselor at the emergency room, and the at the Presbyterian Methodist, Method, Methodist Hospital and a private practice uh, therapist. Um, amazing to have you today. Welcome, Viola. Thank you so much, Lindita. Thank you for the invitation and hello, everyone. Greetings yeah. from uh, New York. <laughs> or I maybe to... around the world or in Albania or in <laughs> yes. Poland. So, I yes. mean, we've been, we've been sharing yes. this Everywhere. thing today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We have a lot to get to today, um, a little bit of heavy topic, but important topic to be discussed. And uh, Viola, let's get right to it and let's go all the way back to your childhood. Uh, what was it like for you growing up in Poland? So the first, I would like to say hello to my Albanian and Kosovian friends, uh, especially hello to Vasvia Goodman. A uh, really famous activist from Kosovo to Farida Rushidi from Kosovo, but originally from Albania, and my lovely Shirete Suleiman, uh, who is really close friend of mine. So, hello, guys. I hope you are here. And greetings from New York. So, as you mentioned, it, I was born in Poland. I was born in uh, Warsaw, that is the capital city of uh, Poland. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as European, you probably know, like uh, we maybe not exactly the same age, but kind of similar. And uh, I was born during the communist. Uh, and uh, mm, I was born in a family where we were struggling with uh, a trauma after the Holocaust. My grandmother, she was a Holocaust survivor and she was also um, a Nazi camp survivor. She spent almost two years in the Ravensbrück. Uh, she was uh, part of the group, what they call uh, rabbits of Ravensbrück. They were Nazis. They were conduct a medical experiment and she was one of them. During the liberation, she was unfortunately raped by the Russian liberator. And that's, you know, just determinate next generation of my family members, my grandmother and later on myself. That's the reason, like my personal reason, um, why I start working uh, with the war rape survivors because of my personal story and my grandmother experience. She admitted her experience when she was already 67 years old after a medical, uh, really difficult condition. She get a stroke and later on when she wake up after coma, she said her story. I couldn't believe for a really long time. After and 60 I, years that she was leaving, so she was sorry, married, she had children. Um, at six years old, she finally spoke out and shared yes. the story. And uh, I used to work already as a clinician. So mm -hmm. I really felt like uh, my mind just split. And in one hand, I was of course, listening what she's saying, but in another one hand, I couldn't believe. 
And uh, I was thinking like maybe she's having some medical consequences of the stroke. I even invite a friend of mine who used to work as a psychiatrist for the geriatric mm -hmm. population to conduct a kind of medical exam. And he said, everything is fine. So you need to believe her. But that took really long time to really face her story and the consequences of, uh, of those story, this story. Mm -hmm. So there is something that is um, generational about there is your grandmother who went through it. What kind of consequences do you think it had in your mother and in you? So that is like really um, interesting because right now we already know, I mean, we as a scientist and also people who working with trauma as a clinicians, uh, something what we call the first trauma, second PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and also what uh, we are using to describe the consequences from the previous generation, mm -hmm. uh, following understanding from the epigenetic perspective. Uh, so that's mean, like right now we know like a trauma is just passed by the next generation. It's, it is unresolved. Uh, the woman or person who uh, just went through with this kind of experience will pass to the next generation kind of, of feelings because our body, this is a trauma. This is not only mental experience. This is also a body experience and or DNA or more like environment for the DNA is changing after this intense really emotional uh, experience such as a uh, rape, for example, mm -hmm. especially during the war. So that's how this looks from the biological perspective, but also because you are going through with uh, trauma uh, in this kind of social, cultural, political, and also religious environment that's also determining kind of behavior or attitude or some kind of messages what you're getting from the society or from uh, loved ones family members and other people and that's also determining your attitude towards experience what you already went through again so trauma related to the rape or rape trauma Mm -hmm. what, what do you remember, uh, your grandmother, how did she show it in the daily life towards you? What do you, do you remember anything specific? So the first and former is the high level of anxiety. I was raised by a people, not only my grandmother, but also my mom, were like really deeply affected by high level of anxiety. That's mean, like I was raised to and I was listening, like, I have to be careful. Mm -hmm. I have to take care of myself. I have to control myself. I cannot allow to anyone to be too close because this is too danger. Mm -hmm. I have to back home uh, earlier because later on is too danger. I cannot spend a time with somebody who is a stranger. I cannot be too spontaneous because this is also bringing a lot of the uh, danger situation. It's like uh, my uh, childhood story is the story about uh, underwear. <laughs> it's kind of really private experience, but also I think it's probably not only my experience, like my grandmother, she used to say like, I need to wear this kind of special underwear, like, you know, cover uh, pantalons, mm -hmm. uh, like almost from 19th century, to cover wow. up myself, cover mm -hmm. up myself and uh, not allow anybody to get easy access to my private part. And uh, she used to say in Pol Pol Polish language, we are saying, be careful because you get a wolf. <laughs> uh, that is literal translation from Polish language to get a wolf. That's mean like, you know, uh, maybe you exposed to, yourself to something what is like danger for you and then that would be a consequences for your body of course this is like metaphorically speaking or, or metaphorical language but uh, under uh this message or 
it was kind of like a fear, like I need to control this part of myself as a woman, because this is the most vulnerable part. And as a woman, I am exposed to sexual violence. And uh, nobody really uh, used the language about sexual violence. Nobody was saying anything like, oh, you know, you're a woman, so be careful because somebody will try to rape you. I never hear something like that. But the fear and all this, you know, the the the, the kind of obstacles and kind of like this um, resistance methods to take care of myself, it was like on regular daily base. And it was like regular message. That's how I was built yes. psychologically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um you have an amazing career you have worked around the world uh mm -hmm. many places those places have been in in africa uh you have uh, spoken to uh rape victims of war um you have heard their stories i mean this woman uh, aside from, i mean go through extreme poverty uh mm -hmm. war uh, rape um they are displaced and they somehow make it they make it yeah what is that how, how do we how do they do it i am big fan of womanhood generally and i am huge supporter of uh this kind of power of women and uh, working with uh, war survivors is bringing a lot not only pain and trauma to my life i would like to say it's much more of joy an experience uh, with this unbelievable resilience part of women and energy. So uh, I don't know. I really don't know how. <laughs> I am asking myself how they can overcome all this experience. How can go through if you know another one part of their life and rebuild this life? How, like many of women, I know a lot of the war rape survivors who are working actively to support all other women, like uh, Vasfi Goodman or, or uh, Sheride or, or, or um, uh, Consolini Michoué, who is a Rwanda survivor, or Jane Lacking, who is again a Rwanda survivor. I met, I met a lot of women who are not only went through with something that is unbelievable, but right now uh, actively support others. That's that Incredible. is their yes. strength yeah their courage it's incredible it's that's true yeah it's, they have to be super women to be able to uh to do it and, and to stand up and, and to uh empower mm -hmm. hundreds and thousands and millions oh, around oh, there, yeah to be strong overcome it and and live good lives um yes you, you don't have to your whole life does not depend on what was done to you, but what you do with it moving forward. And these women exactly. are, I'm personally extremely inspired by them and their story and any woman's story uh, of, of this kind and uh, brilliant. I think it's amazing to be a woman. I think it's- yes. <laughs> that's, so that's just like reminder every time, like, oh my, that is a privilege because I am a woman, I, I can, somehow share this experience with other women and i can support other women and i can get support from their side that's just really special yeah so one question to to clear to clear up any 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 doubt what is rape what is rape oh so um we can describe rape from a few perspectives, from the legal perspective, from the psychological perspective, medical perspective, social, mm -hmm. cultural perspective. Uh, because I am a clinician, mm -hmm. I will stick with the definition what I am following uh, working uh, as a clinician with other people. So uh, rape is the unexpected, really uh, intense uh, attack to your body without your permission. And uh, we, this is like a traumatic experience related to something what wasn't planned by you. 
and happens to you without your will. And uh, if you clearly feel or you clearly felt like somebody is inviting your body without your permission, this is a rape. Mm -hmm. So oh, that's, that's how we can describe rape. As a traumatic, intense, uh, violent, experience from uh outsider or stranger or outsider i think the outsider word is better here mm -hmm. um you mentioned uh you you say that uh, rape is a twin of the war everywhere yeah. there is war there is rape why yeah that's as you know uh dr uh dennis mukwege who is a famous gynecologist uh from congo Bukau, Congo. He is leading uh, Mukwege Foundation for uh, years. Uh, uh, he is living in a war zone for decades already, and he is actively working and supporting war rape survivor in Congo, uh, is, is part of Congo. So uh, he was mentioned this many years ago, uh, like uh, the, the war is always existing with this kind of uh, violence against the most vulnerable population, that's mean a woman and children, and why it is. Probably because this is the easiest way to terrorize everyone. Uh, probably because this is the, somebody said something, it's really uh, difficult, but that's also a truth. Like this is the cheapest weapon. <laughs> Uh, so you don't need to buy any gun, any Kalashnikov, you don't need to proceed with anything else. You're just using your own power related to the situation when you are violent and you are using a violence against other people. Because rape is complicated, the consequences of rape are complicated. So that's mean this is violence towards your body and your uh, mental health being, but also this is the violence violence against society, family. This is uh, a violence against uh, some uh, native groups. And uh, that's the reason why this is so popular uh, and why uh, rape is you know, related as a twin part to any kind of so, uh, mm -hmm. violence, like a war violence all over the world. So what is fascinating for me and scary in the same time to see like uh, we already spoke about my uh, story. So you are aware, like uh, my grandmother's story is related to the war during a Holocaust and to the experience from the Holocaust. But I met after a year's working um, on the field, I went to the, um, uh, to the refugee camp in Tanzania and I met a young woman who, Oh, who was survivor after Wanda genocide and uh, uh, she was kidnapped and moved to Congo. And then from Congo, she escaped with her two uh, kids and she told me the story. So uh, her story, and I really, I felt strongly listening this story, like this is story about my grandmother. <laughs> Even I met her in completely different environment. <laughs> Her experience was completely different, like my family experience, but the consequences of rape and the uh, damage to her life, I can compare it to some kind of damage what I was observing uh, living with my grandmother. I mean, mostly psychologically, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, that's probably is somehow the answer to your question, because you can destroy it a lot using the and you say, Viola, there is also like uh, social consequences, right? As, mm -hmm. as we can elaborate a little bit about yeah. that. It is the yeah. immediate family, but it's the, really the entire society that is yeah. affected. By so, and uh, that's, you know, my grandmother survived a rape during second war. And after war, she 
almost immediately get married. She delivered my mom and she was trying to rebuild her life. She never spoke with anyone about her experience. And I understand just because in 40s and 50s and 60s, it wasn't available, this kind of support system, what we can find right now, but also because of the social silence and right. kind of punishment. But uh, moving forward, right now, when I am talking to the survivors from the old Yugoslavia uh, war in the 90s in Europe, in the center of Europe, is the same. Yeah. It's, you know, 50 years uh, later and all survivors, or most of them, they are struggling with the same consequences, like a social consequences. They are afraid like they're going to lose their family, their yeah. husband, they will leave them, uh, their uh, 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 neighbors, uh, or other people, they will punish them or they will make jokes of them or they will be exposed and oh, they will be in this really vulnerable position. So it's still the same consequences even we are living in different society right now how does it affect the people who do not speak about it like they hold it inside um how does it affect them so sometimes i am saying like this is like you can uh make the picture and try to imagine like you are living in active volcano inside you Mm -hmm. So you feel all the time something, like something what is really disturbing, what is coming back to you, what makes you feel um, some particular feelings in this kind of situation. It's a lot of triggering situation when you feel deeply affected, almost like you are coming back to this dangerous situation, what's happened to you many years ago. So... Uh, I would like to say like you are living your life, but you are partially belong to something what's happened to you in the past. Sometimes because uh, human nature is really complicated, we are using uh, a lot of defense mechanism and we can split partially this kind of experience, but our body is responding. So that's mean like, for example, you're having uh, a lot of nightmares. Uh, you cannot sleep or you having just regular insomnia. You having a lot of problems, many of survivors, this is really, really sad. Uh, they are struggling with cancers. I personally, because I really, I conduct a lot of interview and that is something that put my attention. I didn't try to get a deeper understanding, but a lot of survivors later on, they are struggling with some physical serious uh, illnesses. Mm -hmm. So your body just reacting to this high level of unresolved stress related to this traumatic experience. So no matter how difficult it is to speak and the consequences of yeah. speaking, it's a thousand times better. And at the end, it can, it can be like whether you live a long life or not. You know, like, like you have such a much better quality of life, you're saying, and a long life if you take therapy for it, if you speak, and if you get over. How, how can the survivors get over the, the shame? Like the shame seems to be a big, a, thousand, a million dollar question, I know. But what are some things that they can do to help them not look at themselves as they are to be shamed. So I knew it like, uh, again, like regarding my grandmother's story, she was silenced and voiceless her life, all her life because of shame. And she was deeply afraid to be punished if she will speak up and stand up and share her story because of also this social construct, what she was living with or in. And uh, I think this is the biggest uh, problem for many of survivors. Like they feel the first, that's what is really important. Like a, a rape, this is only one crime, only one where the survivors is taking on all responsibility on uh, their shoulder. So you was raped and you feel like this is your responsibility. This mm -hmm. is your fault. 
you did something wrong. And every single survivor, if this is like a separate individual, uh, you know, situation, and you was raped, unfortunately, in New York because uh, somebody raped you, or if you are a survivor of the many kind of this sexual violence situation, for example, right now in uh, East Congo. Every single survivor will admit later on if they get some space and uh, uh, possibility, like they feel like that is their thought. And uh, when I noticed this regarding my grandmother, like she really feel guilty because she was raped with this kind of like surrealistic almost. I knew it, like this is part of the problem. Like I want to put more attention to the shame part. Mm -hmm. And uh, shame uh, from, again, from the psychological perspective is a tool how the society is controlling uh, kind of behavior of people in the society. Mm -hmm. And shame related to our body, to our sexuality is the most uh, useful tool to control people, mostly, of course, women. So we are a race. And if I was born in Poland, you was born in Albania, or many of other people what I met, he was born in Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, South Korea, or other places, they are raised the same way. Like they feel, or oh, we are feeling the same way. Like that's our responsibility to control ourselves. And if something happening to us and we are raped, that is our fault and our guilt and we need to be ashamed of it and that is of course kind of understandable like we will be punished mm -hmm. so that is universal now because uh i am a feminist and i am not afraid to say that this is part of the patriarchal system when you know like uh because we are living in this con social construct this is part of the oppression against women body and a uh, woman independency. Hmm. Um, sometimes family members uh, might know it, might assume it happened, but they don't speak about it. Like there's no, like they rather leave it silent. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? What, what is why they're feeling? Uh, again, shame and guilt like that is probably the major reason. Also like, uh, uh, like if someone like a family member is already aware, like something happens to, for example, I would like to say his mother a sister or wife somehow is sharing uh, this subconscious guilt. Like I wasn't enough, like I wasn't enough uh, to support her in this situation. I didn't take care of, or I didn't do it something. So because of that, because of guilt, uh, we have kind of tendency, nobody likes feel guilty, no one here or in other places. So we have like natural human tendency to project this kind of feelings. And that happens often when we feel deeply affected by guilt, we are blaming others. So that's the reason why it's really easy to blame uh, survivors because they are strongly believe it's just easy. Like that is their thought. Even it's not because we are great, right? Like this is not uh, anybody thought. If you was raped, that is the rapist thought, always. If you follow any kind of social construct and myths, like, oh, I was wearing short skirt, or I was drunk, or I used drugs, or I went with somebody to the bar, and more and more, that is still not your thought. You was just in a situation when somebody, for some reason related to the violence, used their power to uh, rape you. The rape is always fully on the rapist's shoulder, never on the victim's shoulder. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to blame uh, survivors. And again, if this is individual uh, accident or this is a war situation, always a survivor will feel the same way, like 
that's my responsibility. I did something wrong. And that's why that happens to me. And that's also is so difficult to change, especially when we are living in the society or our survivors are living in a society where is additionally some other uh, pressure related, for example, to the religion. I am not saying like a religion is always uh, uh, something what is punishing the survivors, but can be part of the social punishment. I see. A lot of violence, would you say, in our in in just our society in general, societies in general, right? Um, women get raped not only in war zones, but they are getting raped yes. everywhere, every day. Uh, why there is such, you know, why we have such sexually violent violence in our societies? That is a great question. And I think that is the question probably related to the uh, human race history and also uh, to the uh, understanding how we build our society as, you know, like generally this patriarchal system. So we're living in society when justice is not obvious, when uh, injustice is something what is almost everywhere, when somebody who is in power and can use the power will use the power. So that is partially the answer why a rape is still everywhere, not only in the war zone, and why uh, especially males uh, they are using this this kind of uh, of uh, violence against other people. Mm. Um, oh well, who rapes? Rapist. <laughs> it's always the same. So but, you know, can can we be raped by yes. like a husband? Like yes yes so the statistic is showing clearly like uh, over 70 percent if we are talking about rape related mm -hmm. to just regular life because again this is different when we're talking about rape in the war zone is different when we're talking about this kind of sexual violence related to the regular life is different mm -hmm. so over 70 uh, 70 percent of of uh, cases uh, are related to the uh, situation when the survivors know uh, their abuser. So that's mean like a rapist is a husband, a father, brother, cousin, friend, neighbor, teacher, uh, doctor, uh, in any other person who is in our uh, social or family circle. So the rapist, this is not a person who is just, you know, a stranger during the night who is attacking us suddenly. That's of course happens, but I said, as I said, over 70% of the cases is related to the somebody what we know. Wow. What causes men to commit rape? I think like, uh, um, I don't really, I made a decision. I, 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 I mentioned the story to you uh, previously, but I made a kind of commitment to myself and also to other women a years ago after when I went to Rwanda a few, three years ago, uh, and I uh, was conducting interview with Rwandan survivors from the 1994. Mm -hmm. And I get opportunity to meet with the perpetrator from the Hutu group who was released from the jail. And I met uh, a guy who was really nice and open and uh, he looks absolutely normal. I knew it before when I met him, like he committed a lot of crime and uh, also uh, he is a rapist. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a dichotomy between uh, somebody what I am seeing and what I am interacting with and my idea of rapist, especially mm -hmm. uh, the, the war rapist. 
he was absolutely normal. He was talking to me about what was happening during the, the um, genocide. He admit a few crimes. He was saying like he feel guilty. And I felt extremely confused because he was still a rapist. So I knew it and I, I still can imagine like when you are in the situation when the uh, anger is related to fear, like in the war zone, when you are in a group with other people, when somebody is starting uh, some kind of crime activity that is like a, like a group response. And probably that's what's happened to this uh, person. But during this interview, I made a conscious commitment. Like, I don't want to think about rapists. Rapists is always rapists. And uh, during one of my trainings, uh, before when I become a, a rape counselor, uh, one of our uh, teachers said, abuse is a choice. You have always choice. So if rapist is raping, that's his rapist choice. So that's my answer. I don't want to analyze too deep. I really truly admire everybody who is working with perpetrators and I really su theoretically support them, but that's not part of my activity and I don't want to be involved more. I don't want to understand perpetrators because I really strongly believe like a rapist is making a choice, so. Fair point. Um, there are some misunderstandings about uh, rape, being raped, because women mm -hmm. tend to act differently when, mm -hmm. when the act is occurring. What mm -hmm. are the different ways that, that, we, that they act? Mm -hmm. So um, many of women, again, right? Like we are talking, for example, about just situation from regular life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When unfortunately you are a victim or a survivor of the uh, sexual abuse, you can respond absolutely uh, different than anybody else. And it's not like a one, a pattern of the right response. Sometimes people are fighting. Sometimes they are, and that happens more often, they just froze and they are uh, voiceless and they try to survive, often just trying to also emotionally disconnect themselves from this uh, uh, experience. So um, in many different countries, I know this already because I was doing a lot of research related again to the, the description of the legal uh, uh, definition of rape. So in many different countries, for example, in Poland, unfortunately, uh, the uh, law is describing a rape where a, a survivor, or a victim, need to be active and fight through a perpetrator. Mm -hmm. What from the even psychological perspective is often impossible because if you are in this state of mind and you try to survive and you just trying to to don't make more damage to yourself you are not using any kind of power and that's his individual response to this traumatic situation as i said before rape is every single situation when something physically happened to your body without you will and you always know and that is clear for every woman like when somebody is inviting your body against your will. So you cannot get confused. You know when you want or when you don't want, even if this is sometimes before this kind of uh, interaction unclear for a wife for you, you know when somebody is doing something uh, and using a power against you, this is something what you don't want to, that is rape. Unfortunately, there are some women who blame other women. Oh, when they many. <laughs> um, she's wearing short skirt. She asked for it, which is shameful. Why is that? 
<sighs> so again, because uh, we are as a society struggling with rape for <laughs> probably from the beginning of our history, human race uh, history, that is the part of how we can navigate this kind of heavy traumatic experience. And also when we are living in the society, uh, what we calling a patriarchal system, uh, uh, many of women, uh, they are uh, active participant of the patriarchal system. This is not like a, only men, uh, they are uh, oppressing other people, such as a woman group. No, if you're getting a lot of benefits from, uh, from the side where you are supporting this uh, patriarchal system, you will use probably this kind of description and you will be blame other woman. You know, she, uh, she wasn't behave uh, well. She just, why she went to the bar? Why she spoke with the stranger? Why she were what she were? So that's her fault, that's obvious. And that is like in the United States, you know, probably what well, is really, boys will be a boys. This is one of the most ridiculous description. No, they are not. Uh, they need to behave <laughs> and they need to control themselves and their needs, desire, or whatever it is, before when they become a rapist. And that's not the excuse. This is absolutely not excuse. This is part of the stereotypes uh, where a woman in this a position where we need to control our sex sexuality, but the boys, they are boys and they can do and they can proceed with anything mm. what they are having in their mind. Mm. Um, so I think also I would like to add something. I think also like many of women who are blaming other women, they are usually, I'm not saying like everyone, but also I think they are uh, uh, survivors of uh, uh, sexual violence mm -hmm. or uh, they are next generation of survivors. So that's my also clinical experience. Why do they, why do they, why do they blame women though, other women? Uh, so uh, as you said from the beginning, to face rape, this is heavy topic for everyone. Okay. And, uh, and they can't. Yes. You know, yeah, deal with and it, that's bringing a lot of complex feelings, a lot of pain, a lot of guilt or other feelings. And no, nobody always is open to go through with all this emotional disturbance. So it sounds to me just like the victims uh, blame themselves. They also blame other women. Yes. The yeah. same way. Yeah. So when we realize that it's not our fault, then we can look at other women as it's not. Yes, her. exactly. Exactly. And uh, probably uh, when you will meet with a woman who, uh, who is presenting this kind of tendency, uh, probably I will, you know, like try to talk to her about her own experience maybe about her own uh, understanding about a womanhood, they, uh, they own, uh, uh, her own identity or kind of history related to the uh, woman roles in her family to really get deeper understanding what she identify inside herself and what is happening when she is blaming uh, other women after sexual assault. I like that. Um, so I, um, unfortunately, I have seen that uh, many, uh, it's, I have heard that many women actually blame the women for raising this kind of man who then become abusers, become rapists, become, um, what are your comments on that? So again, I will use more my uh, uh, clinical background to describe this. So if we are living in a society where the power is related to the wild, white, educated, mostly a male, 
and is like the hierarchy of the power. So women need to find their own, own niche on the place where they can navigate uh, their power because we are extremely powerful. Privately, I think like we are more uh, powerful than, than male and that's also part of the, this ongoing somehow war between us. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think like uh, if a woman is living in a society when it's pretty clear, like a male is in this dominate position, she is using all often, and I, I, I was listening this kind of story, especially in the society when the religion also determining strongly you a place in the society. So when you become a mother, you are using your power to raise your son and by uh, your own son to receive uh, power back because somebody previously take your own power uh, as a woman. So I think because of, of this kind of dichotomy, uh, I think many of women are raising a rapist because of anger, because of uh, pain, because of unresolved um, messages, how a woman need to react who is a woman and also who is a male or man. So that is the major question, right? Like uh, 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 when you're raising a kid, you are asking and you are uh, passing some messages, right? Like uh, most of time, a uh, girl need to be cute, sweet, uh, loving, supporting, uh, open, uh, um, like, uh, really uh, in more in the position when you are a giver. A male or boy need to be strong, powerful, angry, or maybe uh, 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 need to present other kind of dominate uh, description of the character and behavior. Of course, I am saying this as a stereotype because also that is different, but generally, uh, all over the world is the same uh, kind of message what is passing on them. Yeah, it voice. reminds me of the same it was for me growing up. Yeah, it was very established social roles. What women had to be submissive, don't yeah. talk back, and uh, a man can uh, even serve if you men, serve men, be cute, men. right? Yeah. Mm. Raise so, kids, cooking and cleaning, right? And yes. you need to be a neck of the uh, male head, which is one of the most, you know, like a really uh, patriarchal message, but that's the truth. And that's also is universal, like all over the places, not only in Europe. Yeah, wherever there are developing yeah. countries. Uh, well, we live in New York City, some of the most incredible, fantastic, phenomenal women are here. Well, here and there, we hear that women want to be strong, but not appear as masculine. Like, how do we, how can we have that balance between being strong, being, uh, very successful, but also preserve our femininity. Is there such thing? So I think this is more like individual uh, and I will be um, more open to discuss with someone who is struggling individually with uh, this kind of, you know, difficulties or kind of contradiction. I don't know, like this is the issue, like a social general issue. Mm -hmm. I think we are all of us, I mean, women and uh, men are struggling with identity right now. There's a lot of changes, a lot of uh, cultural and political and uh, religion, you know, movements. So I think like we are all kind mm -hmm. of, disorganize who we really are mm -hmm. and everyone is looking for this kind of answer Fair but way. i know like probably this old kind of patriarchal uh, old-fashioned patriarchal system is not working well anymore 
especially in New York, what actually personally, I really like it. And I enjoy this part of living here. Like we are living in mostly in this transitional and place and time where we can looking for some more answer. And um, it's not like a strict determinate who you need to be, to be a woman or man or not, you know, even not a, uh, uh, described by this uh, typical way person. So you anything I, you want, however you want. Yes. As, yeah. simple, as simple as that. And exactly. I think the people who say that are mostly, mostly men who say women are, but what does that mean to be, I mean, is it man when you're confident? Is it man when you're smart? Is it man when you're making more money than man? I mean, maybe it's like more so like a man's problem than a yeah. woman's problem. This yeah issue uh, i think uh, uh, women are struggling with a lot of anxiety and uh i think like all those changes is uh bringing more of of fears individual fears and also higher level of anxiety and uh we like something that's again that is human nature we like the places or situation or kind of behavior what we know if something is new, you know, it's kind of adjustment and you need to leave your safe zone and, you know, safe place, what you know. And that's always bringing kind of uncertainty and this uh, uh, disturbing feelings. And that's probably also a reason why this change related to the patriarchal system, also to the role related to who is a woman, who is a man, uh, is slow because it's like um, we need a time to digest something what is uh, what is new. Okay, well, time it's all we have a lot of time for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, our time is coming to an end. But the last question for me is: What is your message to the victims of of rape, to the survivors? What is your message to them? So uh, I would like to say like uh, the first, you are not alone, even if you are living in Pakistan or Bangladesh or India or uh, Kosovo, Albania, Poland, United States, you are not alone. That is unbelievable. This, this circle of other women and people who support survivors, that's first. Another one, uh, you are a survivor, not a victim. And remember that because that is really important uh, to use a language and describe you as someone who survived something what is deeply traumatic. But uh, you can do it. But also remember, like you need a time and your own time. Don't push yourself. Don't blame yourself. Don't follow any kind of direction. What you have to do, only do it something what you feel is right for you. And uh, uh, I think that's that's it. Probably. What's right for you? Take your time. When you're ready, you can that, take your time and don't blame yourself. That is the major first step. Mm -hmm. Then, when you will be ready, uh, just open your eyes and Google, <laughs> and you can find a lot of support everywhere, like literally everywhere. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Viola. It was so wonderful having you on our show. Thank you so much, Lindita. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. And I wish you the best. And I wish the best all women who are joining today this, this meeting and uh, this conversation. To be continued, though. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. This was our show for today. We'll see you on our next show. Stay tuned.